Hello again. This is Dr. Steve Klein from the Department of Communication at the University of Missouri. This video is the latest in a series of online lessons intended to provide you important principles and fundamental concepts for the study of communication. This video lesson is focusing on perception and how the process of perception operates to help us get an understanding of the reality around us. Perception is a psychological concept that is fundamentally important to the study of communication. Not just because how we perceive the world has profound influences on how we communicate with others, but indeed the communication process as we practice it throughout our lives has fundamentally powerful influences on the ways in which we perceive the world. Now in order to understand that relationship, we need to have a basic understanding of how the process of perception works. And there's a couple of interesting things I want you to think about as we get into this examination. First of all, the Hindu religion, and in particular, a story from the sacred text, the Bhagavad Gita, in which the Lord Krishna provides an opportunity for Arjun, a human being, to see Krishna in his divine form, in the ultimate expression of the God who is many and one at the same time in all of its magnificent and multifaceted reality. Krishna had to give Arjun a sense of divine vision in order to comprehend this divine form because ordinary human beings simply are not capable of viewing Krishna in its totality. The process would just literally lead to madness and death for the average human being. That can mean a lot of things, and this isn't a Hindu theology course, but one concept that this idea from the Bhagavad Gita illustrates is the idea that human beings are inherently limited in the reality that we can perceive. We simply cannot completely get a sense of the entire reality around us. There's just too much to take in and too much to process. Now, the second thing that I want you to think about as we get into this process is something a little more contemporary. And it's a series of experiments that have been done by psychologists who are illustrating the ways in which perception is something that can actually trick us if we're not careful. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. Through their series of studies, psychologists Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabris remind us, in much the same way as the Lord Krishna did a long, long time ago, that humans are inherently limited in what we perceive. And in order to understand that, we need to understand what we mean by perception. Perception isn't just taking in sensory input, but perception involves an ongoing process of making sense, making meaning out of what it is that we're experiencing. And this process involves three distinct stages. First, a stage of selection. Second, a stage of organization. And third, a stage of interpretation. These three stages of perception take place in an ongoing cycle of taking in sensory information, 
giving it structure in order to ultimately figure out what it means. Let's take a look at each of these stages one at a time. The first step is selection. We know that we can't possibly make coherent sense out of all of the sensory data that we encounter every step in every day of our lives. There's just too much. So what we do is we focus our attention on certain incoming sensory information. Whether it's conscious, semi-conscious, or in some cases even subconscious, we end up making choices about what it is we intend to recognize in our sensory reality. And in doing so, it's important to point out that we exclude other information. Our mind makes decisions for us what we're going to perceive and what we're not going to perceive. And those things that draw and keep our attention are things that possess what many psychologists refer to as salience, the degree to which something attracts our attention in a particular context. If something has a higher level of salience, that means it's something that's at the top of our mind. It's on the tip of our tongue. It's something that we can think of and recall pretty quickly. If something has a low salience level, it's not something that generally grabs our attention. We may have a memory and an understanding of it, but it's buried down deeply somewhere. And if we want to try to retrieve that information, we have to do a little bit more work. So how does this process work when we're perceiving something new in the first place? The selection stage of perception really depends on the context we find ourselves in. You can think about this context almost as a reality screen, if you will. On one side of the screen are the stimuli trying to get our attention, and on the other side, the reality we end up perceiving. This context is going to involve variables such as the environment we find ourselves in, the situation we're faced with, what sort of sensory stimulation we find particularly interesting, the needs and interests we have at that moment, the expectations that we would normally have for any of these kinds of variables. So given all of these contextual circumstances, our mind is going to make some principled choices. When the stimuli comes our way, our screen is going to let some of the things that are most important through and are going to deflect other things. What gets through are the elements of the stimuli we find salient and the others, well, it's just not as important. After selection, the next stage of the perception process is organization. We've got all of this sensory data that already has been curated by the contextual screen of the perception process, right? So we already have only paid attention to certain pieces of data. Once that data get through, the next step is to sort and categorize information that we perceive based on innate and learned cognitive patterns. Over the course of our lives, as we observe the world around us, as we engage in certain kinds of activities over and over again, as we communicate with different kinds of people, all of the things that constitute our human existence, we observe and we recognize patterns. And then based on those patterns, we start taking in the data and putting them into a variety of different cubby holes, desk drawers, uh, places in a computer database in our mind, if you will. And so there's going to be information that we save up based on the kinds of things that we think we know about people. And there's going to be things that we are going to put in categories regarding cause and effect relationships based on the laws of physics and any other category of reality that you can think of. When we encounter any new situation, we take in that sensory data and then we start labeling it and putting it into different patterns in order to try to figure out the relationships between them so that we can get to our third step, which is coming up soon. There's lots of ways that we organize the data that we take in. The three most important principles are proximity, similarity, and difference. By proximity, this means that we're going to take certain things that we observe through our senses and to the extent that they are closely related to each other in time or space, those kinds of things go together in our minds. And so if we see one thing and then another thing, our mind wants to put them together because they're in close proximity. Similarly, no pun intended, I guess. Anyway, Similar things we put into categories with other similar things and different things we contrast against one another. So there's inherently a process in taking in the things that we see and hear and find out through communication and find out through our lived actions and experiences. We end up putting things in a bunch of different boxes. 
Now, you can probably already start to imagine that taking everything that we see and putting them into pre-constructed categories, little boxes, if you will, can potentially cause some problems. One classic instance of this kind of organization is what's referred to as punctuation. Punctuation in the context of cognitive perception is talking about structuring what we're observing based on our innate desire to try to figure out a stimulus response or a cause to effect sequence. If something happens and then something else happens, there is a real important imperative in our mind that wants to try to figure out, did one thing end up causing something else? Here's a simple but poignant example of a family conflict that happens because the two parties involved took their observations and engaged in the structural process of punctuation in different ways because they had different observations at their disposal and the outcome is less than ideal. So mom's working at home because of the pandemic, and that means that she has been on the phone all day with bosses, with clients, with other stakeholders, making demand after demand after demand until finally she has just had it. At wit's end, this has been one of those days. So the work day at home is over, and she's finally trying to get a grip on her day when, out of nowhere, the little buddy who's been there all day is asking mom, hey, can I have a story? And mom just throws a fit. You mean to tell me I've got to do something else for somebody else again when I just had some time to myself? And you can imagine what the result is going to be. They both end up feeling really pretty horrible. Now, how did we get to this awful result where everybody feels terrible? Well, in large part, it's because the punctuation that's involved in figuring out the cause to effect regarding mom's mood is resulting in some very different alternative possibilities. In mom's case, her frustration started hours ago during work. So she's been having demand after demand after demand after demand for hours on end. And then the little buddy comes in and what she's perceiving is the latest in a long string of demands just when she thought she wasn't going to have to fulfill any demands anymore. So this has been an ongoing thing and this is just a nail in the coffin of something that started a long time ago. However, the little buddy's going to have a different way of understanding this because he wasn't aware of any of that stuff. He came in, asked for a story, and mommy got mad. And so we've got a situation happening here where now after the conflict has happened, mom's feeling bad because she's starting to realize that she was already angry earlier on and she took it out on the kid when he had really nothing to do with it. But as far as the little buddy's concerned, he is the cause of mom's concern and anger that's pretty awful. So you can see how the process of organizing the various observations that one makes in the perception process leads directly into the third stage of this process. And that's the stage of interpretation. When we're interpreting the objects of our perceptions, we're assigning meaning to our experiences. We're trying to figure out and make sense out of the things that we've been encountering. And we do that, according to cognitive psychologists, by the use of the singular form is schema, the plural form is schemata. But a schema is made up of stored related information that we use to interpret new experiences. And if you think about the way that your mind works in terms of some complex computer database software, you can see how schema actually explains the ways in which we take our organized information and we use it to make meaning and make sense. Very roughly explained, any time that we bring in new data, we're running it through the internal database that compares it and runs it up against all of the other various structures of different kinds of people and different kinds of actions and different kinds of experiences. Everything that we've ever experienced has some schema, some cluster of ideas and previous perceptions that we use to try to make sense of the new data. 
And once that new data comes in, then we end up through the organization process, implementing it into our various mental schema so that the next time we have an experience, we have even more structures of data, more structures of lived experiences and perceptions that we can use to make sense of our subsequent observations. So if we move from organization to interpretation and to try to figure out what happened between this mom and this little buddy, we can see what happened. Based on the way that they punctuated their experiences, mom ends up thinking this. Just when I can relax, I've got to take care of someone else's demands again. So because of the string of observations that she had been accumulating and collecting together during the day, when the little buddy came and asked for a story, she ran this immediately through the schema that was most salient in her mind at the time, which is other people making demands on her time and energy when all she wants to do is relax. Now, of course, there are other schemata that she could have processed this request from the little buddy from. Uh, her schema of being a mom who interacts with her son and does things like reads stories and spends time after work. But in this particular instance, because of the nature of the day, the mom schema was not nearly as salient as the everybody is taking a chunk out of me today schema. Subsequently, when the little buddy is trying to figure out what's going on, he has no idea that mom has been subject to all of these demands by all of these other people all day long. Like, that's not his world. He hasn't had any opportunity to observe that and to make sense of it. All he knows is he came up to mom. I just wanted mommy to read me a story. I really missed her today. Did I do something wrong? Because usually mommy doesn't get mad when I see her after work, but now she did and she yelled at me. And when I've been yelled at in the past, that's because I've done something wrong. So I must have done something wrong this time. And so the little buddy is drawing an incorrect conclusion, but the conclusion that he's drawing is pretty rational based on the schema that he is applying. Now, of course, we don't want to leave this story in a bleak as condition as this. So we do need to remember that this perception process is an ongoing one. And based on the way that we interpret our observations, we make sense of them through perception, we can go on to continue observing, selecting data, organizing it, and then finding meaning out of that new organized experience. So to come back to mom and little buddy, they're both feeling pretty awful right now. I feel terrible. Look how sad he is. I feel terrible. Look how sad she is. Well, they're having an opportunity now after the initial blow up to observe each other and to try to make sense of it. And so when mom's looking at the little buddy and how he's acting and reacting in response to the way that she behaved, she's able then to get that through her organizational process to start thinking about the appropriate schema. I've been busy working all day. He must have missed his mommy. And now he thinks he did something wrong. When mom is able to look at the perception process from the standpoint of the little buddy and the kinds of things that he observes and the way that he makes sense of the world, she's now in a better position to draw a conclusion that makes better sense. I shouldn't treat him like a coworker or a boss that's making a demand of me because that's not who he is. He's my son. And when he wants to read with me, that's because he wants to be with me. And I really enjoy that as well. And I do this because I love him. So taking the opportunity to look at things from this alternative standpoint enables her to move from the workplace chaos schema to the mother-son family time after work schema. And so we have the possibility for a redirect. I'm sorry I behaved that way. I was angry about something else. You didn't do anything wrong. I missed you today, too. Can I still read you that story? Yay, mommy! And all's well that ends well. And the reason why this was able to end well is because while the perception process can lead to some pretty horrible misunderstandings and misinterpretations from time to time, there are things that we can do to redirect our perception and to try to refine and fine tune our interpretations of reality. And that's not just by taking a look at how we organize 
the things that we selectively attend to uh, based on our own frames of reference and use those as a basis for interpretation, but also remembering that among our various frames of reference, the schemata we have in our mind for making sense of the world includes our past communication and our relationships with other people. So if we're able to think in terms of what sort of schema is going to be most appropriate for trying to understand and communicate with this other person with whom I've had communication and relationships with before, we have a better shot at actually being able to engage in perception that is a more accurate and a more helpful and productive reflection of reality. So in a nutshell, that's the perception process. If you've got any questions about the content in this lesson or anything else that might be related to it, please don't hesitate to reach out and let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you next time.